Hi folks, it's good to be with you and love to everybody out there. My website is jasonburnspreacher.com and uh, it's good to be with you and love to everybody out there. We're looking at uh, annihilationism and the doctrine of hell and uh, we kind of went through um, uh, Christopher Morgan's article The Biblical Evidence for Hell and uh, www.legionnaire.org uh, The Biblical Evidence for Hell by Christopher Morgan and we basically just looked at uh, uh, a general scriptures in the New Testament and we were fair, we looked at scriptures uh, which uh, might teach the opponent's view but we looked at all the scripture and then when we cut all the scripture together we came to a conclusion that hell was eternal uh, etc so that was a preliminary ambience. It was basically, excuse me, a basic uh, introduction. And uh, I'm not feeling too good, so forgive me. Um, I'm not feeling at my best, so uh, forgive me for that. So now we're, we're going <clears> to <throat> go into more uh, scholarly issues uh, on the doctrine of annihilationism. Now this article is by J.P. Holding, J.P. Holding, and uh, I'm going to read uh, the article and then uh, give comments, okay? Now this is a very good article uh, refuting annihilationism. Annihilationism, an unbiblical doctrine by J.P. Holding, just type in J.P. Holding, annihilationism, an unbiblical doctrine. And uh, that's a very, very good essay on the issue, okay? He talks about that th this, this view, this, uh, this doctrine is, uh, he's going to look at the New Testament, okay? J.P. Holding, Annihilationism, an Unbiblical Doctrine, you can look at this paper on his website, Tecton uh, Apologetics. So uh, I'll read bits of it. The majority of verses that describe hell say nothing at all about the time frame for occupation of hell by the wicked. For this may we conclude that there is a chance that the doctrine can be averted. One major problem with such a stance is this, when Jesus speaks to the Pharisees about hell, in Luke 12, 4-5 and Matthew 10, 28, he speaks to them on ascertainable ideological ground. Josepha reports that the Pharisees fully believed that the souls of the wicked went on to eternal punishment. So in other words, when you're reading the text in the New Testament about hell, the Pharisees believed in eternal torment. So you've got to get that in mind that that's how they understood Jesus when he was speaking. Maybe acknowledge, of course, that immortality was conferred upon souls rather than being an intrinsic part of their nature. This much is correct from the annihilationist camp in agreement with 2, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16. But it's not true that the Jews believed in a doctrine of soul sleep in which the soul passed into an unconscious state until the resurrection. That much is shown by Moses and perhaps Elijah making an appearance in the Transfiguration. <clears throat> Some critics may argue that overall there was a diversity in Jewish views of the ultimate fate of the wicked, but since the questions were here involved involves a known view of the part of the Pharisees, the question is mute. In other words, the Pharisees believed in a doctrine of eternal punishment so when we're looking at the New Testament that's the context that's the main context of any passage he goes uh, some may object to Josephus Josephus did often present Greek thought in his work or explain Jewish thought in Greek terms in a way that sometimes failed to represent the Jewish thought with perfect accuracy but there's no evidence that led Josephus to falsely ascribe a Greek belief to a Jew. The Pharisees either a believed in eternal torment as Josephus said, 
did not believe in it, but Josephus either recast their beliefs in Greek fashion, just plain lied about what they believed. The later two are rather hard to swallow since Josephus was a Pharisee himself. It is hard to see what Pharisee's belief would have had to be recast into eternal torment or why he should have ascribed a position to the Pharisees that they did not hold at all. In order for this argument to mean anything, it has to be proven that the Pharisees did not actually believe in eternal torment, that Josephus therefore may have made some sort of mistake. Simply arguing from the possibility of guilt by association is to argue in a circle. The data as it stands clearly indicates a Pharisee belief, Pharisee belief in eternal torment. So basically, that just destroys a lot of um, a lot of the annihilationist exegesis of the New Testament because the context of Jesus, when the Lord was speaking about hell, was in the context of the surrounding culture believing in a hell at the time, uh, eternal punishment. So, getting things in the historical context that kind of destroys any annihilationist argument. As we examine verses that are used to support the argument for eternal punishment, two key words will crop up. We will look at these first. The first key word is Ionios. This is the word translated as eternal. There is no other Greek word that can refer to an eternal period of time. The only word I have seen suggested is uh, pantot, carried the idea of regularity or dedication which is used rather than time frames. For example, Jesus replied, I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews came together. I said nothing in secret. John 18.20 This word verse tells us is used in cases that refer, refer fairly uniformly to the being of God or to plans and to realities which once are established by him are perpetual and unchanging since the word is not used of more mundane realities like the Flowering of fig trees, one cannot argue that the same kind of temporality is attributed to these as to the being of God. Bar, page 77. Wal, uh, Walvord, following Bias, counts 66 occurrences of Ionius in the New Testament. 51 of these refer to the unending happiness, unending happiness of the righteous. Two refer to the duration of God in his glory. Six indicate an endless amount of time in other contexts. And seven appear in reference to the punishment of the wicked. A counter-argument seeks to make the point that Ionius may in some cases refer to a limited period of time. For the word by itself, we may say that while it is true that it may refer to a time which began at a certain point and continued into the future for eternity, and once in the case of Romans 6.25, backwards from a specific terminus, it never has any other meaning than an eternal period. It signifies that whatever some critics may... It signifies that whatever some critics make this claim, no examples are provided as proof. So when Jesus says it's eternal punishment, what he's saying there, the Greek is, it's eternal punishment. That's looking at all the Greek examples, 60, 66 examples of the word eternal. It, it generally means eternal, going on and on and on. I think that's a powerful argument against annihilationism. Uh, there is, however, a second way in which the annihilationist conditionally suggests that the strength of Aeonius can be deflected, and we will look at that when we reach a specific site below. The Hebrew equivalent is Olam. It is used frequently for things or events which will, will or do end. To try to deflect the meaning of the Greek word through the use 
of one in Hebrew does not do full justice to the intricacies of one language to another that is completely different. But indeed we need to not even go in that direction, the assertion is misleading. Olam is used not of things that will end, but things that did end, but were meant not to. Specifically, it is used to refer to ordinances in the Jewish law which were to be kept by the Israelites. The word Olam is also used to describe the ten tenor of a slave, indicating that his service will last for eternity, the entirety of his life. One might argue that it indicates the time that ends, but the parallel usage of Olam in the phrase, as long as he lives, in 1 Samuel 1, 22, 28, indicates that what lies behind Olam in these cases is something of a figurative sense of forever that stresses the permanence of the person's condition. Bar, as well, in biblical words for time, the primary study on this subject regards Olam as meaning essentially in perpetuity, i.e. forever. A second word is apolumi, which emerges in our translation as destroy. This is an important word for many annihilationists like Pinnock and Fudge actually see it as favouring annihilationism in Matthew 10.28 and 2 Thessalonians 1.9, Philippians 3.19. But the meaning of the word and those related to it does not refer to destruction in the modern sense that the word is used for the annihilation of something. Rather, it is closer in meaning to the word we use destroy to mean ruined or lost, as in he destroyed his family with his drug habit. Lest there be any doubt, take a look at some verses where the same Greek word is used and ask yourself when he any, when, were any of the item questioned annihilated. Matthew 10, 6, go rather to the lost, that's the uh, same Greek word, apolumai, the lost sheep of Israel. Matthew 12, 14, but the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Matthew 26, 8, when the disciples saw this, they were in, indignant. Why this waste, they asked. Luke 15, 24, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost. Apulain, the Greek word, um, apulumai. And Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. Other words are used of the destruction of the wicked. An example being uh, kata thyro in 2 Peter 2.13, translated as utterly perish. Paul uses apolumi in 2, 1 Corinthians 15.18, translated perish. Paul's hypothetical argument here makes it clear that he means they will not live again. Also, the Old Testament speaks the final end of the wicked in terms of such as cut off, will be no more or slain, they will not be found, vanish like smoke, perish, be destroyed, be torn to pieces, vanish like water, melt like a slug, etc. These pictures cannot possibly symbolise perpetual conscious torment forever. So these are the kind of arguments that the... Um, Annihilationist, annihilationist use. So, annihilationist will say other words are used of the destruction of the wicked. An example being catafiro, uh, 2 Peter 2.13, translated utterly perish. Paul uses apolumi, 1 Corinthians 15.8, translated perish. Also, the Old Testament speaks of the final end of the wicked in terms of cut off, will be no more slain, they will not be found, vanish like smoke, etc. This is the annihilationist reasoning here but what holding has shown is when uh, annihilationists use their favorite passage which is um, Matthew uh, 10 28 that the words destroy has a variety of meanings and doesn't mean very often doesn't mean literally destroy as in annihilation and he's given a number of different passages that show the different meanings to the word so then the annihilationist comes up with well, what are all these old testament passages that talk about the wicked are cut off 
what about a few other words of parish that different Greek words so now holding comes in now and, and gives his response I will simply ask the question in any of the places where a palamai is used did the things in question cease to exist as whatever they were no the oil of Matthew 26 did not cease to be oil it was simply so it was argued by Judas put to use as it should not have been it remained oil the same may be said of every other example I cited and of 1 Corinthians 119 the plans did not cease to exist as plans they simply did not fulfill their intended purpose this is right in line with the traditional view that while God intends us for eternal life with him those who are upon it are Palumai lose out, but do not in any way evaporate or cease to exist, but, pre but per our understanding of the nature of hell, fits in perfectly with hell as a place of shame. The words, other words are used is true, but besides the point, 2 Peter 2.13 at any rate refers to people currently living on the earth. Now specific sites, some of these are stronger than others, but these are intended. The most clear indication available these we may add to the social background add above indicate the doctrine is one that is both assumed and taught in Christianity. Now just a little thought concerning the Old Testament. The annihilationists will use the Old Testament as a proof of um, hell. Uh, sorry, uh, annihilation. But number one, whenever an annihilationist says, look, it says cut off in the Old Testament or destroyed, Ask them, is there a fourfold chronology in that text? Can you see in that text death, resurrec uh, resurrection, judgment, and annihilation? Any Old Testament text they quote, ask them, can you see the fourfold chronology of death, resurrection, judgment, and annihilation? And they'll have to say no. So you say, well, it's not annihilation then, is it? So ask them about the fourfold chronology. Is it in the Old Testament text that you quote it? Secondly, ask them about progressive revelation. How do they see the Old Testament? Is it progressive? Is it, is it slowly revealing more and more like a seed in the Old Testament and a flower in the New Testament? Do they see the Old Testament as progressive revelation? Or do they see the Old Testament as a... Um, as a... Um, linear... Right. In other words, you know, exactly what's in the Old Testament is exactly what's in the New Testament. Because, for example, the Trinity, it's taught in a shadow form in the Old Testament, but it comes to its full doctrinal clarity in the New Testament. Alright? And it's the same with the doctrine of hell. You know, we get glimpses of it in the Old Testament, but it comes into its fullness in the New Testament. Now, if you don't have that view, you're always going to see annihilationism in every text because you're not allowing the scriptures to, to come and be taught you in the way it's progressed and revealed to us. Now, the argument might go, well, let's look at each text in its context. So you look at an Old Testament passage that talks about will be cut off and they'll say, well, you know, in their mind, that's what they'd be thinking, that they'd be just cut off. But again, if you go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to 10, Paul talks about the Old Testament is a place where it's revealed about Christ. So you can't assume that the people in the time of the Old Testament didn't think about a future resurrection or a future judgment of eternal hell because they were looking for the Messiah coming and all the ramifications of, that, of what that would be. So, you know, and also there are philosophical problems. Uh, if people died in the Old Testament, what happened to those who were wicked? If you read all the references in the Old Testament to Sheol, Sheol talks about people are dead, the word Sheol, but also where the wicked go. So if the annihilationist is saying that the Old Testament teaches annihilationism and brings out a verse that says the wicked have been annihilated, all you've got to say is, well, where's the soul? Has the soul been annihilated? And they can't say the soul has been annihilated. 
So the passage doesn't teach annihilationism. And if they want to get tricky about it, you can say, well, you always quote Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear man who can kill the body, but fear God who can destroy the soul and body in hell. Is there a soul? They'll have to say yes, because that's the verse they quote. Well, if there is a soul, when you're quoting the Old Testament, and you're saying that they've died and been annihilated, did they have a soul? Yeah, where's the soul? So whenever they use the Old Testament to teach annihilationism, those are some of the ways... That, and, and then when you look at many texts in the Old Testament, it teaches about Sheol as in death and Sheol where the wicked go. So you can show quite clearly from the Old Testament, the wicked go to Sheol. It's a place. It's not a good place because it's where the wicked go. All right. So um, it takes on uh, some passages that the annihilationists use and... and Matthew 10, 28, Luke 12, 45. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do more. But I will show you whom you shall fear. Fear him who after the killing of the body has power to throw you into hell. In this case, the Matthew parable passage is much clearer in description than the Lucan one. However, they are complementary rather than contradictory. And it shows you that the interpretation that the annihilation is used to say that it means that the body and soul are killed in hell. The Luke passage actually shows you that they are thrown in hell. Um, so, it actually undermines the uh, annihilationist position. The Luke passage actually when you put it alongside the Matthew 10 28 it kind of evens it out and helps you to understand fully that it's not t teaching annihilation. In this case the Matthew parallel passage is much clearer. This is fairly clear statement that the soul and the body will be destroyed in the sense noted above not annihilated in hell. Annihilationists and conditionists have a great deal of trouble with this verse, knowing that the resurrection of the wicked is clearly taught in the New Testament. Some will deny the nature of the resurrection body but of the wicked is the same as that those who are justified that it will eventually lose all vitality and duly die. But there is neither scriptural nor social warrant to suppose that there will be any difference in this way. Another tack is to argue that the word kill and destroy being in parallel should mean that they indicate the same thing, which seems all too obviously without any obviously without any linguistic support. Finally, an appeal is made to Luke's parallel version being itself a parable to Isaiah 6, 6 24, which supposedly argues against eternal punishment. We will look at that verse shortly, but generally to make this argument in this way begs the question or whether or not the punishment described is eternal or not. So again, what the annihilationists do when they're confronted with a problem, they'll go to the Old Testament. But we've already shown how to deal with the Old Testament. So when they hit a problem, they'll, they'll kind of like try to explain it away from the Old Testament. The annihilationists will say, Scripture nowhere even hints that the wicked receive an indestructible body. Where can it be proven that the re so Holding says, where can it be proven that the resurrection of the wicked with an indestructible body is unscriptural, extra scriptural? Yes, it's a proposition I derive from logic, not with, but also not contrary to Scripture. One Corinthians fifteen does not say that only those in Christ will be raised immortal in some way. I would agree that the resurrection body of the wicked will be different from that of the Christian, following the biblical logic of a sown body bearing fruit that corresponds with the nature of the body, but there is nothing in Scripture that contradicts the idea that the bodies of the wicked will be somehow destructive, destructible. On the other hand, this argument may be pointless to begin with, 
If hell is a place of shame rather than literal flames, then the bodily destruction is completely metaphorical, and the destruction of the body is irrelevant to begin with. I would disagree with uh, J.P. Holding there, um, but um, there is from uh, Daniel, I think Daniel 12, the resurrection of the body of the wicked. So I would disagree a little bit with uh, J.P. Holding here, because he's saying it's symbolic, hell is symbolic. Daniel 12, 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they shall be wise, and, sh and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the ferment, for they that turn many into righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So there is clear view of the resurrection body that sinners are given a resurrection body as well so I think part of what Holden is saying is correct but at the same time I don't agree with when he's saying hell is symbolic but it gives problems for the annihilationist if there is a resurrection body why would God give a resurrection body to the wicked on the day of judgment and then annihilate it doesn't make sense Matthew 12 31 to Mark 3 29 and so I tell you every every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven even in this age or in the age to come that's a very clear statement about uh, eternal hell because people it's implying that people exist and they're not going to be forgiven fudge uh, Fudge will say, uh, this is what Fudge the Annihilationist would say, to say that the sin is never forgiven is not the same as saying its perpetrators will always endure conscious torment for committing it. It is possible in our society for convicted murder to be pardoned, but if it is not forgiven, the, forgive, the, the form of his punishment is beside the point. He is no more pardoned if he is executed for his crime than if he spends 1,100 years in prison. Uh, Holden says, it seems to me that the explanation begs the question. If a special, special point is made that sin is never forgiven, then it seems to me to imply that the person will always be around to experience the forgiveness, unforgiveness. One would argue, as Fudge has, of course, experience the non-forgiveness. One could argue, as Fudge has, of course, but to do so makes the whole point of Jesus' teaching superfluous. Why make a special point to say that a sin is never forgiven in given time periods unless one will be around to fully experience those time periods? Matthew 25, 46, they will go away unto eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Up until now, our verses have been a bit vague, so often by a parallel, but this one is harder to explain. Pinnock objects to use of this verse, saying that it gives no indication that the eternal destiny involves conscious suffering. Therefore, he says we have the freedom to interpret this verse as not indicating such a thing. I think it's quite plain that Pinnock is here simply trying to insert 
a concept into the text that is normally implied or indicated by the social background data. Significantly, his only answer to the counter that the eternal life being conscious must indicate a parallel to the eternal punishment being conscious is, I beg to differ. Obviously, begging the question is really the only way to get round what is quite evident of the text. Shaw is more vague when he argues that the length of Onosius must be determined by context. Hence he argues allowing that the fellowship with God means a duration of Eden of God himself that is forever. So it is that the character of the existence out of the apart from the fellowship with God determines a non-eternal punishment. May I frankly say that this argument by Shaw makes absolutely no sense at all. Which is perhaps why he doesn't bother to explain it. He has assumed an equation of God everlasting, life everlasting. But has offered no corollary for the counter equation. Only the con condary corollary, what is it that equals not punishment everlasting? So then we go into uh, the Annihilationist, we'll say, Mark 3.29, a phrase, eternal sin is used, surely eternal sin does not mean that the one who is guilty continues sinning forever. No, it is meant to tell us that the result of the sin is a question remains forever, not the act itself. Hebrews 5.9 says the Annihilationist, the author uses eternal salvation. Does this require us to understand that Jesus is eternally saving believers? Certainly not. Hebrews, more so than any other New Testament book, makes it clear that salvation was accomplished one for all. What this phrase tells us is that the finished work of salvation is ionious in its result. End of quote. This is Annihilationist speaking. Once again, all that is done here, says J.P. Holding, is question begging. This seems without any justification that punishment in, is in exactly the same way category of sin and salvation. My question is, in which Greek grammar does it specify that any time Ionius is paired with a noun, it signifies a process that is a completion? It is not found anywhere. It is a rule created by an annihilationist position. At the risk of being anachronistic, Anachronistic, by dealing with English rather than Greek, let me use a comparable word to punishment to make a point. Annihilationism would have you, us believe that punishment refers here to completed process that is eternal in its results. But let us say that rather than eternal punishment, we were to be sentenced eternal entertainment. It is a word paired with Ionius, we will say, and it is found formed from a verb involving process. Follow, following annihilationism logic, someone sentenced to eternal entertainment will begin eternity by, say, watching a few black back episodes of Three Stooges, then have it turned off from there on. I thought this was eternal entertainment, you would cry. Sure it is, Gabriel answers. You can remember that the Stooges episode were like and laugh about them for the rest of eternity. This would sound like false misleading advertising to me, and that is what the above annihilationism argument regarding the word punishment is. It is twisting of the normal meaning of a word to suit a given position. Of course, if annihilationists would show someone that the Greek word behind punishment refers somewhere as ex to an experience that includes under the rubric of the punishment an effect not actually experienced by the one punished, but merely a result of the punishment, then they might begin to have a case. Mark chapter 9 verse 43, 8. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter eternal life, maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to, to enter eternal life triple than to have two feet be thrown into hell. And do, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have the eye... to to have two eyes thrown into the hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. In using this verse, Jesus alluded to the Old Testament noted above. This verse in Isaiah was interpreted as referring to the torment of eternal punishment 
both in rabbinical sources and in Jewish apocryphal works like Judith. Against the use of this verse, Perik objects that Judith, and presumably any other work, should not determine the meaning of Isaiah or Mark. It shouldn't, since when have the tenets of critical analysis been abandoned simply for the sake of eliminating troublesome teaching? Nowhere else is it said the rabbinic and apocryphal sources should not determine the meaning of some in the New Testament. Why is it the case here? If this is abandoned, then wisdom of Solomon and Philo are out of understanding the Trinity. A stronger argument notes that the bodies in question are said to be carcasses and therefore could not possibly be suffering. This is a valid point that should be considered seriously, for the word used here is clearly used only of corpses, 2 Kings 19.35, Isaiah 37.36. Well, this is in context of Mark 9, 43 and 8, and Isaiah 66, verse 24. On the other hand, it's just obvious that this verse does not support annihilationism. In fact, we note, the indication is that just as the righteous continue to come for worship forever, so that they will continue to go forth and see these who are outside of the city. We are therefore faced with a, therefore faced with a paradox of the dead bodies that perpetually burn with no indication of consciousness, but we are certainly not given any sense of annihilation. We are left only with later interpretive methods with deduce this verse to indicate eternal punishment. The fact that Jesus applied the name Gehenna, perpetually burning garbage dump, to this place, this question of eternal consciousness is in view here, then why is there an option presented of entering hell with a whole body? If the person is not conscious, what is the point? I conclude that the data is marginally in favour of the interpretation of interpretable in internal punishment in Mark. And we may add that knowing hell as a place of shame confirms what this passage means, for to have a, a dead body exposes a not, a not buried was a sign of great dishonour. He goes on, these words are obviously, that the annihilationist would say, these words are obviously taken from Isaiah 66, 24, as used by the prophets, they signify not perpetual torment, but rather death, plain and simple. J.P. Holden replies, I need only make the point here, that if we wish to stress that Mark had to use Isaiah in exactly the same way as Isaiah did, then all typ typological prophecy is invalid. It was my acknowledgement above that Isaiah cannot be used by itself to support eternal conscious torment. However, it is also clear that some later Jewish interpreters use this verse typologically in favour of eternal torment. The evidence of this verse being coupled with a domination about the whole body leans slightly in favour of the traditional position. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, 9 He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will punish with everlasting destruction and shut out of the presence of the Lord from the majesty of his power. Unlike many, unlike many of our verses, this passage uses the word olathros rather than the one of apo, words above. However, it, will, it still has the meaning of destruction, punishment, ruin and death. I have thus far seen no argument against this verse that we have not already covered elsewhere in some form, but we can add that since Paul describes the punishment as being shut out from the presence of the Lord, there is a strong implication that the persons in question will exist and continue to exist. Note that this refers to the loss of fellowship with God and has nothing to do with God's omnipresence as such. It is therefore perhaps the strongest verse against annihilationism and the least able to be reinterpreted. Jude 7. In a, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns give themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example for those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Some also try to cite this verse to favour annihilationism, for it argues that Sodom and Gomorrah were totally destroyed and they no longer suffer. It also adds that since these cities are cited as an example, who notes that the word is used in secular sources to mean samples of corn or produce, that therefore reality must follow example. Eternal fire here refers to the results, not the course of events. This is possible, 
but one should recall that in earthly terms there really would be no suitable example of an eternal fire that could be called upon. The closest possible analogy to an, analogy to an eternal fire for the Jew would be the legendary perpetually burning Gehenna garbage, Gehenna garbage dump. And even that of course would eventually go out. So the fact that an earthly example is used here does not mean that we can discount a teaching of eternal punishment. Revelation 14, 9 and 11 And third, the angel, that them, the angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worship the beast in his image and receive his mark on his forehead and his hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength in the cup of wrath, he will be tormented with burning sulphur in the presence of the only angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment rises for ever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and his image, or for anyone who receives his name. So, the annihilationists don't deal much with that, as uh, Holden goes on to say. So that that's the article. Uh, J. P. Holden, J. P. Holden, uh, on annihilationism, uh, annihilationism, and on biblical doctrine. I, uh, I've done enough on annihilationism now. I, I, uh, I think we've done enough to make people think. Um, I'm going to read this. Uh, this is uh, L. Raymond's uh, Systematic Theology, uh, published by Nelson. And uh, I'm just going to read this on annihilationism. Just as the apocalypse gives us a picture of the state of a glorified church in heaven in Revelation 21, verse 1 to 22:5, that is sheer rapture. So he's given us an equally graphic representation representation of hell. That is sheer horror. Revelation 14, 9 and 11, John declares that he who has the mark of the beast will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of wrath, and that he will be tormented in fire, and the smoke of their torment rises for ever and ever. And those who worship the beast have no rest day and night. Here eternal conscious torment is said to be the punishment of those who have the mark of the beast. In Revelation 19, 20, John speaks of the lake of fire, that burns with brimstone and in 2015 Revelation 2015 declares if any name that was not found written in the book of fire he was thrown into the lake of fire which is the second death for such Jonah notices as these in the apocalypse it is clear that divine judgment awaiting evildoers is certain just and eternal these features of eschatological judgment have led some modern evangelical theologians who consider the doctrine of unending conscious torment to be, if not intrinsically, or intrinsically unethical, at the very least a reflection upon the gracious side of divine character to propound the theory of the impenitent final annihilation of the body and soul. In fact, the Doctrinal Commission of the Church of England issued a report entitled The Mystery of Salvation. Hell is not eternal torment. This is January 1996 of the Church of England. Hell is not eternal torment, but the final and irrevocable choosing of that which is opposed to God so completely and absolutely that the only end is total non-being. Donald Guthrie, of course, correct when he states that the doctrine of eternal punishment is not an attractive doctrine and the desire to substitute for it the view at the judgment the souls of the wicked will cease to exist is understandable. But, and with this Guthrie would agree, the Bible 
which, after all, is our only rule of faith for the doctrine of hell, will not endorse such a substitution, nor is such a substitution really any more acceptable to the modern mind than the traditional view, for there would still need to come the moment when God would annihilate the sinner by casting him into hell, a notion equally repugnant to the modern mind, which would have God to be a God only of love. Nevertheless, no less an esteemed evangelical John Stott advances four arguments related to, to, to turn scriptural language, scriptural imagery and scriptural divine justice and scriptural universalism to make the case for the impenitent annihilation. His first argument makes the basic point that eternal perdition is often described in scripture in terms of sinner's destruction. It would seem strange if people who are said to suffer destruction are in fact not destroyed. And he goes on there. Old Testament, the doctrine of eternal punishment. J. M. Motia correctly observes that while the Old Testament contains only a suggestion of diversity of density for the godly and the un ungodly, no sooner does Christ bring life, immortality, light than he also reveals eternal loss and death so that even in here it's otherwise equivalent to Sheol, cannot refuse the further significance. The simultaneous maturing of truth concerning eternal gain and loss is ignored by every attempt to divest the New Testament of its grim doctrine of eternal punishment. What are some of these Old Testament suggestions of a diversity of destiny for the godly and the ungodly? To begin, as evidence of the Old Testament distinction between the divine deliverance of the godly on the one hand and the divine destruction of the ungodly on the other, one might cite the, dis dis the, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, showing righteous Lot mercy in Genesis 19.16. God delivered Lot and his family from Sodom. Then we read, The Lord rained down burning sulphur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. Early in the morning Abraham looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. Genesis 19, 24, 27, 28. Then the intimation of eternal loss respecting the un ungodly may be seen in the Old Testament heron principle. Recall, for example, that in conquering Sion, Israel, Moses wrote, to call his towns are completely destroyed, one of them, men, women, and children. We left no survivors, Deuteronomy 2, 34, and that in conquering Og, Israel left no survivors, Deuteronomy 3.3, 3, destroying men, women and children, Deuteronomy 3.6. Here we see Israel carrying out the hem, devoting and hence ban principle. The irrevocable giving over of a person and thing to the Lord, often by destroying them. Liberal theologians and free thinkers have found that this principle exceedingly distasteful and repulsive. The accordingly have concluded that God of the Old Testament is barbaric in the extreme, governed by sub-Christian ethic and in no way to be identified with the loving God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But Meredith J. Klein rightly affirms, actually the offence taken is taken at the theology and religion of the Bible. As a whole, the New Testament too warns men of the realm of the everlasting ban, where the reprobate devoted to wrath must magnify the justice of God whom they have hated. The judgment of hell are the heron principle come to full and final manifestation. Since the Old Testament theocracy in Canaan was divinely appointed symbol of the consummate kingdom of God, there is found in connection with it an intrusive anticipation of the F ethical pattern that will obtain the final judgment beyond. That's a brilliant, um, that's an absolute brilliant, that's an absolute brilliant exposition of the Old Testament. Supporting this perception, the preacher of Ecclesiastic declares, God will bring every death deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil, Ecclesiastes 12.14. And the, then there are the two explicit Old Testament statements supporting diversity of density for the godly and the ungodly, found in Isaiah 66, 24, 20, 
22-24 and Daniel 12-2. From his commentary on Isaiah, De Leach states here that Deron is the strongest word in the Hebrew for abomination. It is perfectly obvious that the picture itself is here described must appear monstrous and inconceivable. However, we may suppose to be to be realized he is speaking of the future state, but in a figure's dawn from the present world. The object of his of his prediction is no other than the new Jerusalem of the world to come, and the eternal torment of the damned. Jesus uh, later citation of Mark 9.48 in Mark 9.48 and then we'll just read uh, so this is a, a very very good on annihilationism there's quite a lot of it's quite a lot of good So we'll just read one more, uh, Mark 9.43 It is better for you to enter the life man than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. Jesus' word translated hell here is Gehenna, the Aramaic form of the Valley of Hinnom. It is derived from the Hebrew uh, place name in 2 Kings 23.10. Since fire burned continually in the valley of Gehenna because of a symbol of the unquenchable fire of hell, a place of perpetual fire and loathsomeness for the meaning of topper which became a synonym for the site as a whole. So he's saying that it's a continual fire. So, oof, I'm glad I finished that. So you need to go and read that. You can get it probably on Google Books uh, on Annihilationism uh, by Robert L. Raymond. Uh, systematic Theology by Nelson A New Systematic Theology of the Christian Faith Dr. Robert Nelson uh, Robert L. Raymond uh, Published by Nelson Publishers Okay So we've looked at uh, Morgan's article We've looked at J.P. Holden's article I think it's fair to say that, generally speaking, uh, the scriptures uh, teach an eternal torment. Um, and the teaching that tries to undermine that is very, very acidy, very, very dangerous teaching. So let's pray. Father God, we just thank you uh, for your goodness, we thank you for your love, we thank you for your grace. And Father, help us to live in the light of these truths. That there is an eternal torment to judgment to come. And we just pray that you bless us. We pray that you speak to us. We pray that, Father, you bless each person who's heard this video, these videos. That you minister to us and that you be with us, Lord. We just thank you for your love and grace and for your mercies and blessings. We give you the prayers, we give you the glory, we give you the honour. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. God bless you. I hope that's been a blessing to you. It's just a small contribution to think about the doctrine of hell. Um, and so get all of those two articles by J.P. Holding and Christopher Morgan. And don't forget, there's a ten-part series on hell by um, Al Martin on Sermon Audio. And also there is a four-part series by R.C. Spruill on hell at Legionnaire Ministries. Legionnaire Ministries, R.C. Spruill, four videos on hell. And then you've got uh, Al Martin's ten sermons on hell. So thank you for listening and God bless you. Take care.